Good afternoon again. We're going to talk about pharmacology and particularly the implications for poor adherence and sanctuary sites that may apply to reduced drug regimens currently in development. Here again are my disclosures as required by the organizers. We're going to review pharmacokinetic issues, drug distribution issues, and resistance issues that may apply to reduced drug regimens. And I'd like to start with the combination of long-acting cabotegravir and long-acting rilpivirine that we discussed earlier, because I think it pre presents some very good opportunities for understanding the potential limitations of reduced drug regimens. Just as a reminder, these are data that we'll be examining from the ATLAS and based on the ATLAS and FLARE studies, the two large registrational trials um, that were completed um, and presented last year for uh, 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 long-acting cabotegravir and rilpivirine as compared to oral therapy. It's important to note that in these studies, there were some interesting differences in cabotegravir pharmacokinetics noted as a function of sex at birth, but also baseline body mass index or BMI. And so at four weeks following the first injection, the median cab concentrations were lower in females than in males by 40% quite a large difference in concentration. However, by the time week 48 had arrived in this every four week regimen, the trough concentrations of a cab were actually slightly higher in females than in males. And this suggests that although females have initially lower cab concentrations, their trough concentrations after 48 weeks were higher. And that suggests that the uh, release of cabotegravir from its depot site is slower in females than in males, but the, uh, but the time of release is longer. And we'll take a look at those data uh, shortly. In addition, four weeks following the first injection, median cabotegravir concentrations were lower in individuals with higher body mass that is a BMI of greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared by 46% as compared to those with a BMI of less than 30 kilograms per meter squared. However, as was the case with a female sex, by the time 48 weeks rolled around, the cabotegravir trough concentrations were similar regardless of body mass index. Again, suggesting that the release in individuals with a higher BMI was slower, but the time of release was longer. And so after 48 weeks, it really didn't make that much difference. Um, looking at rilpivirine concentrations, interestingly, there was no effect of sex or BMI over the 48 week study period. And keep in mind, these are different formulations. And so their uh, long acting pharmacokinetic properties uh, therefore are likely to be different. So these are the cabotegravir concentrations uh, presented last year at ID week, broken down by uh, sex at birth and by body mass index, showing that females had a lower uh, ca uh, cabotegravir concentration within the first eight weeks, but after 48 weeks actually had a higher trough than males, although this was not statistically significantly different. It's important to point out that despite these uh, uh, differences, uh, all concentrations were well above the target, which was the protein adjusted IC90. So here are the same data broken down by body mass index, showing that the individuals with a higher body mass had lower concentrations early in the study but by the end of the study, out to 48 weeks, concentrations were really indistinguishable. 
Now, we know that the development of resistance to rilpivirine and cabotegravir in uh, Atlas and Flare was likely related in part to low drug concentrations. And these are just data published uh, last year in Nature Communications looking at this issue with cabotegravir in six individuals and showing the relationship between uh, cabotegravir, cabotegravir concentrations, development of resistance, uh, and um, uh, viral load. Um, and and this, the, this particular study uh, was uh, in uh, non-human primates. Um, and so we are not yet exactly sure how this relates to the development of cabotegravir resistance in humans, but given the data from Atlas and Flare, I think this makes sense. Um, similarly with rilpivirine, the, uh, there is a, a relationship between suboptimal concentrations, that is suboptimal exposure to this drug and the likelihood of development of resistance uh, with, uh, in this case, a K101E mutation and a rebound in a viral load. So it's important to point out that despite the fact that females and individuals with a high body mass index had lower cabotegravir concentrations, their outcome at, at week 48 in terms of viral suppression was the same as that of males um, or individuals with a lower body mass index. And that's shown um, in this slide presented at EACS uh, last year. So that's reassuring. However, as these drugs are used more broadly in the real world, what are we gonna do about situations that may produce suboptimal drug concentrations? And of course, the situation most likely to do that is patients who are late for their clinic appointment or miss a clinic appointment. Here are simulated concentration versus time profiles for six different scenarios involving long-acting cabotegravir given every four weeks. Uh, these were data presented last year at ID week. Um, and so these situations involve either no delay in clinic visit uh, in uh, part A here, or uh, a, an injection a delay of one week uh, for injection two in B, a delay of, of uh, four weeks uh, with two or three ML initiation in part C, et cetera. But I wanna point out to you parts E and F where there's a four or eight week delay in uh, showing up for your uh, cabotegravir injection. And in this situation, uh, there are two uh, options that were modeled. One is no oral bridging with uh, the oral equivalents of the drugs cabotegravir and rilpivirine, but the other in the black line here is with oral bridging. And what you can see is with a four week delay, probably not uh, much risk of developing resistance for um, having concentrations fall below this target. Um, uh, but for the eight week delay, it looks like a substantial number of individuals in a population could have their cabotegravir concentrations fall below target. Um, and so an oral bridge in this situation looks like a quite viable option for preventing suboptimal drug concentrations and the development of resistance. And so I think as we use these drugs more broadly, I think sending patients home with a, an oral uh, backup is going to be an important way to make sure we prevent our patients from developing resistance um, if they miss a clinic visit or can't come to the clinic for whatever reason. This is a similar uh, uh, modeling exercise for long-acting rilpivirine showing the value and the use of an oral bridge for rilpivirine um, if, a, if an injection dose is missed. Um, and in this case, this is a, a, a missed injection of up to um, uh, eight weeks or two months um, and showing the value of, uh, of 
enhancing the ropivirine concentrations during that time with 25 milligrams of ropivirine given every day, which uh, is the standard dose. And again, uh, uh, emphasizing the potential value of an oral bridge um, as a way to deal with this uh, potential uh, weakness, if you will, in this uh, reduced drug regimen. Now, uh, I want to also mention the issue of whether you need one drug or two drugs for PrEP. Um, since we're talking about reduced drug regimens, I think it's important to look back at the HPTN-083 study, which involved randomization to either uh, injectable cabotegravir every four weeks as PrEP or the standard, which was uh, oral daily true uh, tenofovir and emtricitabine for PrEP. And as a reminder, uh, as I, as I uh, discussed earlier in this session, the one drug regimen actually beat the two drug regimen in this study. So despite there only being one drug for PrEP, uh, the one drug regimen resulted in uh, one third the number of infections as compared to the two drug regimen, a, a, very, uh, a very dramatic result. Um, we know that was the result, but we don't yet know exactly why. So some have argued this is the consequence of the injectable cabotegravir having a better pharmacokinetic profile over time and guaranteeing antiretroviral concentrations above the infectious threshold for the virus. Um, some people think this is the consequence of occasional non-adherence with daily oral PrEP. Um, others have pointed out the higher barrier to resistance of the integrase inhibitor, cabotegravir, as compared to tenofovir and emtricitabine. But the honest answer is it could be something else. It could be something we haven't even thought about yet. One of the interesting uh, uh, consequences of these data, however, uh, is the possibility of reconsidering one drug maintenance therapy involving an integrase inhibitor if the regimen is an injectable regimen like long-acting cabotegravir. Uh, we would never use um, one drug maintenance therapy with an integrase inhibitor like dalyotegravir because there were treatment failures. But uh, what about the possibility of one drug maintenance with cabotegravir? Uh, this may be something we now uh, would uh, want to think about again. Um, one of the reasons that these regimens uh, um, uh, uh, did not perform the way they did um, uh, is, is related to risk behavior. So one might have argued that, well, maybe the people who were on the injectable cabotegravir um, had less risk behavior than people on the daily oral tenofovir. Of course, was a, this was a double-blinded study, so they shouldn't have known which they were on. But in fact, when they looked at incident sexually transmitted infections, uh, they were identical during the study for the oral daily arm as compared to the injectable cabotegravir arm. Now I'm going to finish by bringing up this point, which I think is largely consciousness raising about reduced drug regimens, and that is implications for treatment and prevention of hepatitis B virus infection. Um, it's important to remember that the uh, 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 global viral hepatitis epidemics are increasing rather than decreasing at a time when HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria are decreasing. And so these are um, projections based on World Health Organization statistics showing that by 2040, uh, although the tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria mortalities are all expected to fall, the worldwide mortalities from chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection are expected to rise. We also know that the global hepatitis B epidemic largely overlaps with the global HIV epidemic particularly in the southern parts of sub-Saharan Africa, as shown in this top map here, um, but also in uh, parts of uh, Southeast Asia. And so uh, we need to keep in mind that reduced drug regimens may not have adequate coverage
for hepatitis B virus infection as compared to traditional three drug regimens. Only tenofovir uh, in the form of TDF or TAF or emtricitabine or lamivudine have anti-HBV activity of the available antiretrovirals. No other antiretrovirals, including the new NRTI is latrovir, cover HBV. And in addition, there is concern that lamivudine alone may be inadequate for long-term hepatitis B virus coverage because, because it is not as potent as a tenofovir. The use of novel two-drug regimens that do not contain tenofovir will therefore require baseline HBV testing prior to drug initiation or if there is a switch from a three-drug regimen to a two-drug regimen. And this will increase treatment costs relative to the cost of antiretroviral therapy, particularly in low and middle income countries. So as we talk about a more widespread use of reduced drug regimens, this is an issue I think we all need to keep in mind, particularly if we work in parts of the, of the world where there is high prevalence, prevalence of hepatitis B virus infection. So I would like to thank uh, my collaborators and those who contributed to uh, the data I shared with you this morning, especially Marta Bofito uh, from Chelsea and Westminster. Also recognize my funding sources at NIH and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And for those who would like to learn more about long acting regimens, um, please visit the LEAP website, longactinghiv.org. Uh, where there's lots more information about uh, what we are doing and where we're likely to go with these kinds of formulations uh, in the future. Thank you.